Oh, praise the Lord. We thank God for the truth of His Word. Amen. We thank God that He is speaking in this hour and that we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, we're going to begin verse uh, 10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Amen. Because thou hast kept my word, the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. Praise God. Are you keeping his word? Are you allowing his word to slip? Many today are allowing the word of God to slip. They're allowing the truth to fall into the streets. They're not considering the truth to be valuable, to be precious. They're not understanding the value of the truth. If you'll keep his word, he'll keep you. That's the requirement. You must keep his word. You must lay up his word in your heart and keep his word. Keep guard over his word. Do not let his word become so familiar to you that it becomes contemptible. You know, they say familiarity breeds contempt. Don't become so familiar with the Word that you think that it's just the same. No, His Word is powerful. Amen? The Word of God is powerful. Yes, the truth is the same. Yes, the Word is the same. But it gets more and more powerful in our life the more we believe. Amen? You may not see in the same word the day before what you see today. You may see something more today than you saw yesterday in the very same scripture. So don't become so familiar with a verse of scripture like John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Don't let that God's word jot every tittle. There is treasure. There is value. When you read your Bible, realize that every single scripture, every letter, every jot, every tittle, every bit of it has value. Amen? Do not allow the Word of God to slip. Don't allow any of the truth of God's Word in any measure. Do not allow it to slip from your life. We need to guard the truth in our life. We need to guard the truth like it is our life, because it is our life, people. Understand that without the truth, we are in trouble. The truth is what makes us free. Amen? Now, we see that the loaves and the fishes were given out to the multitudes, but we see they had no value for that which was left behind on the ground. But he told the disciples to gather up the fragments. Don't let anything be lost. Nothing be lost. Now, the people didn't value the, the fragments on the ground. And it seemed that the, even the disciples were murmuring, complaining, because they had to pick up the fragments that were on the ground. Now, that was, that was bread, just physical bread, and just to keep the physical body alive. But think about this. Jesus is the bread of life. Amen? And how many times do we partake of him, amen, and we have so much from him that we just become careless to some of it, what we hear or what we see in the word, and it becomes like the fragments that are left behind on the ground. Brothers and sisters, we need to come to the place to realize that every piece, every thing that we receive from the Lord is important. You must come to the place of value to understand that every jot, every tittle in the Word of God is absolutely imperative and it is there for a reason. Don't allow 
those that are coming along today and trying to retranslate the Bible. Don't, don't give yourself over to these new translations of the Bible. Every dot, every tittle, every, every single uh, comma, every uh, mark that is in the Bible is there for a reason, people. Understand that. It's for a purpose. There's a reason why certain verses of the Scripture are broken up from other verses of Scripture. There's reasons why sometimes it's a comma and not a period. There's a reason why God, by His Spirit, will reveal those reasons. But we need to understand and not allow one piece of that living bread to fall to the ground. Not one piece, not one fragment be lost. Amen? Let's not be like those in this hour that's eating and being so careless. Let's not be like the disciples murmuring, complaining to the degree that Jesus was so ashamed of them that he sent them in a boat and they ended up in a storm. No, let's be servants. Let's have a servant's heart. Amen. They they didn't understand the honor. They did not understand the honor in what Jesus was allowing them to do in feeding the multitudes the loaves and the fishes. Remember, the bread that they were feeding to the multitudes was a miracle of God. Jesus had just performed a miracle, and you think they would be excited that they would be a part of passing out that miracle, of handing out that miracle of the fishes and the loaves. But they began to murmur and complain, just like you and I do. And Jesus was so embarrassed that he constrained them to get into a boat. If you all don't want to serve joyfully, if you don't want to have a smile on your face and be thankful that you're allowed to serve with me, well, I'm, I'm, not, even, I'm not going to have you send the people away because your attitude's not right. See, the disciples wanted Jesus to get in a boat and they wanted Jesus to leave the people and leave them behind. But Jesus wanted to send the people away properly. Do you realize the multitudes that were being fed that day, Jesus loved them just as much as he loved the disciples? That Jesus cared about those people as much as he cared about his own disciples? Do you realize that Jesus Christ is God? And that was God that was there. And God loves his creation. And the disciples didn't have the same value for those people as Jesus did. And so Jesus was embarrassed in the way that the disciples were treating the people and the attitude of their heart. And it might not be that the people even picked up on it, but certainly Jesus did and constrained his disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side. Well, anytime you get apart from Jesus, remember, you're going to get in trouble. And Jesus was trying to teach them. It's not your place to to lead me. You're not supposed to be telling me what to do. You think you know better than I know? Okay, get in that boat over there that you want to get in. And you go on and sail out into the yonder. And you find yourself in trouble, friend. But Jesus went up into the mountain and prayed, praise God. And that's where the disciples should have been. Up in the mountain praying with Jesus. Overlooking the storm. Jesus saw his disciples in in the storm. They were in trouble in the storm. And Jesus saw them in the vision and he walked on the water. He went out there. And I want you to know in this hour, Jesus has a few that are up in the mountain with him praying. And they see the church in trouble. And they're getting ready to walk on the water. They're getting ready to come out on the storm. Brothers and sisters, don't be like those that are murmuring, complaining in this hour that the work is so great and I don't want to serve the people. You need to have a right spirit. You need to have a right heart. You need to have a right attitude. I get to serve God's people. I get to serve the Lord and His people. I get to be a part of this miracle. I get to hand out the fishes and the loaves. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus was talking to the disciples after this and he said, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they thought he was talking about that they forgot to take bread on the boat. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. 
He wasn't talking about the leaven. He wasn't talking about the bread. He was talking about hypocrisy. Amen. He was trying to help them to understand the truth. They were being hypocrites while they were out there passing out the the loaves and the fishes. Jesus was trying to help them to understand you can become like the Pharisees if you're not careful. You can think you're better than the multitudes. You can think you're better than the ones that you're feeding. Just because you're with me, just because you associate yourself with my name, doesn't mean you're better than the multitudes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Today the church says, for God so loved the church that he gave his only begotten son. It's not for God so loved the church. The Lord is willing that none should perish. And when we get so self-righteous and such a, to a place of hypocrisy and there's so much leaven in us that's puffed us up and made us so proud that we think we're better than the world around us, I want you to understand we're going to find ourselves going out into a storm without Jesus and we're going to get in trouble. We need to humble ourselves. We need to walk with the Savior. Amen. We need to serve with Jesus. Don't ever think that you're better than somebody else. Don't ever get puffed up. Don't ever think just because you're saved and you're with Jesus Christ that somehow you're better than those around you. I see the arrogance. I see the hypocrisy. I see the self-righteousness in these that make videos on YouTube and try to talk negative and try to say terrible things about people and they speak out against the the, the rock stars in the country, in in the uh, Hollywood stars and they say things, but they're so self-righteous when they say it. Be careful. You might find yourself headed into a storm. Remember, Jesus was the one that constrained them. Jesus is the one that constrained them to get into the boat. If anybody you can trust, it's Jesus, right? But Jesus is, he said, I'll even help you believe a lie. Okay, you don't want to serve with me. You don't want to be humble. You don't want to be thankful that you can be a part of this great miracle and serve my creation. You don't want to be a part of that? Okay, I'll help you believe a lie. Get in this boat and go on on to the other side. See how well you do by yourself. Oh, we are all the time trying to lead Jesus. But it's time for us to humble ourselves and realize He must lead us, brothers and sisters. Let's stop trying to lead Jesus and let Him lead us. Let's stop trying to teach Jesus something. Let's think. stop thinking we know something more. We know better than Jesus. We need to humble ourselves. God's people need to humble themselves. Be thankful that we have an opportunity to serve in this hour. You find yourself serving the world around you. You want to thank God that you have a part in that. But I can tell you right now, if it wasn't by the grace of God, you'd be just like they are. Like Paul the Apostle said, he said, such was some of you. Such was some of you. Can you see Jesus getting a hold of his disciples? He's not, the, the multitude's still there. The people are still there. But the Bible says Jesus wanted to send them away properly. He wanted to greet them and send them away properly. Can you you imagine how Jesus, each individual, how he wanted to uh, just shake their hand or he wanted to smile at them or he, he just wanted them to know he cared about them. And he took the time. I don't know if he went through all the whole multitude and he and he touched the hand of every single person or that he smiled at every single one of them. But he wanted to send them away properly. And we're living in a time where even the church doesn't show respect where respect is due. I've seen my own pastor, the way he spoke against Obama, and it's affected me, and that leaven's gotten in my own life. The leaven of the Pharisees got into my own life. That leaven that got in him, and it puffed him up. Now it's started to puff me up. When the Bible says, pray for them that are in authority, pray for them. I, I hear my pastor say, oh, well, Obama's not my president. That's pride. If it wasn't the grace of God, he'd be in the same shoes as Obama. Let's humble ourselves and realize it's just not the grace of God. We wouldn't be saved. It wasn't the grace. God didn't save you and I so we could be better than other people. He saved us so that others could be saved. He saved us so that we can be a light to this generation around us. Amen. 
Ultimately, he saved us because so we'd be saved. So our soul would be saved. But it's twofold. It's not just so you'd be saved. It's so that you'd be saved and so you'd be a light to those around you that are in darkness. But the leaven of the Pharisees, that leaven of the Pharisees, beware of it. Beware lest you think you're better than others around you. Beware that you actually think you're better than those you're serving. Beware when you think that those that you're serving just because they're not walking with Jesus that you're better than they are. Amen? You find yourself being constrained by Jesus and getting into a boat to go into a storm because they would not receive the love of the truth. God would send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. And say, Brother Joseph, what's this got to do with the title of your message today? Because you kept my word, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come upon all the world to try them that are upon the earth. Is Jesus constraining you to get into a boat, to head into a storm? Is Jesus in this hour telling you, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead of me. I'll meet you on the other side. I'll catch up with you. Why didn't the disciples say to Jesus, we don't want to go anywhere without you. Jesus, you want us to separate from you? You want us to go ahead of you and you're going to stay here? That doesn't make sense, Lord. They should have scratched their heads. They should have wondered, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense. Everywhere we go, he goes with, we go with him. We, we, we follow him. We, wherever we, but they, this is, doesn't make sense. Why is he asking us to separate from him? Why is he sending us apart from him? Why is he telling us to get in this boat, but he's not getting in this boat with us? You ought to question that. You ought to wonder. Have you been asking Jesus for something so many times you've asked him to the point where now he's telling you, okay, go ahead. Over 15 years of my life in a relationship that went nowhere. Nowhere. Because I didn't ask God if it was his will. I remember the day I asked, I said, Lord, should I marry this person? He said, you can if you want to. You can if you want to. That should have been a red flag to me. But it wasn't. And I headed into a storm without Jesus. Yeah, Jesus was with me. Jesus was on the storm. He had walked out on the storm. He was there and he was trying to show himself and telling me, come, come, Joseph. Come unto me. And I, yeah, there's been times I've tried to get out of the boat and I'm walking to Jesus and I get my eyes on the storm and I start sinking. I've all, we've all been there. But why am I in the storm in the first place? And it wasn't until years later that the Lord said, Joseph, you shouldn't have asked me if I, you should marry this person. You should have asked me if it was my will. You see, I wanted Jesus to follow me. I wanted Jesus to go with my plan. And I learned. I got myself an Ishmael. Maybe some of you out there got an Ishmael. But thank God he has an Isaac for you. He has an Isaac for you. Hallelujah. The promise of the Father. He's got a plan for your life. Now don't stay there and just, uh, you know, mourn over your Ishmael. Realize that God has something for you. Get up off the ground. Amen. And in this situation, hear his voice. Hear what he's saying to you. Now, I don't believe altogether that Peter, you know, should have asked Jesus for him to come out walking on the water. I think it's better to allow Jesus to initiate than for us to initiate. Because if we're doing the initiating, we're the ones that are leading. Are you listening? We should be listening for his voice to initiate us. 
And in this instance, Peter is initiating Jesus. Bid me to come out on the water, walk unto you. Okay, that's what you've asked me to do. I'll do it. But I didn't initiate it, Peter. You're not ready. You're not ready to walk on the water, son. You're not ready to walk on the storm. But if you really want to do it, come on. Come on, Peter. He wasn't ready. And there's a lot of folks today, they're trying to initiate Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus initiated. No, it's you and I that need to be initiated. Amen? It's you and I that need to wait on his initiation. Lord, we need to hear your voice. I don't want to go and say, Jesus, um, let me go to this country. Let me go this place. Let me go over here, Jesus. And the first time the Lord may say, no, I don't want you to go over there. Oh, but come on, Lord, I really want to go. Maybe about the second time, third time. Okay, go. Go on. How many times did the disciples probably come up to Jesus and say, boy, we're, we're kind of tired. You know, there's a lot of people out here, Jesus. Aren't you tired, Jesus? You know, just knowing human nature, I can just see him, you know, come on, Jesus, let's get in the boat and go. Let's go. Come on. We, we've done enough work here. And if he didn't see them saying that and hear them saying that with their physical voices, certainly Jesus heard their murmuring, complaining in there. He knew their thoughts. And who knows what their thoughts were, right? Jesus is taking care of the multitudes. He's God and he's listening to their thoughts while they're murmuring, complaining. Now he wants us to pick up the fragments off the ground. It's not enough that we had to hand out the loaves and the fishes to the people and we're exhausted and we don't want to work anymore. We're already tired before we started this task. You know, we just found out about John being being beheaded and, and we're going to get some rest. Jesus said, come apart and rest a while. And now we're feeding the multitudes. How come we didn't get any rest like Jesus said? We we're going to get to rest. How many times we go on vacation and we think, oh, I'm going to get some rest and you don't get any rest. We'll do that for a vacation. But we won't do that for Jesus. Amen? And I can just see the picture. Jesus can hear the disciples. Can hear their thoughts. Hear their murmurings and their complainings underneath the surface. The people are not hearing it, but Jesus does. And I can only imagine how many times Jesus suffered it. Okay, they're just human. I'll let them, you know. Just like it says, as it was in the days of, of Noah, the, the long suffering of God waited, and, and, I can, and, and, and I will not always strive with man because he's also flesh. I could just see it. Jesus was striving with the disciples out there. But there came a point where Jesus said, Enough. It's enough. Because I'm sure that those thoughts that were deep down inside started to surface. And before you know it, their attitude began to show on the outside. And to the point where Jesus said, if I let this go any further, then the multitude is going to actually see the attitude of my disciples. They're going to see the demeanor. They're going to see their countenance has fallen. They're going to see that their attitude's not good. And then that's going to reflect on me. And Jesus was saying, I'm not going to let that happen. You get in this boat and you go to the other side. You think you can lead this? You go ahead and lead this. Folks, Jesus hears our thoughts. He knows our thoughts. He can hear the murmurings and the complainings. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not long before what's on the inside begins to show on the outside. And I'll tell you right now, the Lord's going to distance himself from those that call themselves Christians today, but they have no joy. Those that call themselves Christians today, but they're bringing an embarrassment upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you right now, the Lord's going to distance himself and they're going to end up in a storm. You're going to end up in trouble. It's a serious, serious thing. We need to follow Jesus. And I don't believe there was any sign on Jesus' face that he was displeased with the people that he was feeding with the multitude, with the little children and the mamas and the, and the daddies. and Do we love people? Do we really care about people? Because Jesus does. Do we really, truly care about people? Can you see them out there? The, the moms, the dads, the brothers, the sisters, the little, little children. This is his creation. And these disciples, 
They were the waiters that day in this restaurant, so to speak. And, the, and, the, and what was on the menu that day was a miracle from God. They were a part of serving a miracle. Folks, we need to let the Lord help us get that leaven out of our hearts. Don't be affected by the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say that you're a Christian, but yet you don't serve with joy. Don't say you're a Christian, but you have no joy. We need to serve with joy, people. There needs to be joy in our hearts, with joyfulness. Serving the Lord with joyfulness. Serving with joyfulness. Amen? Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you, if you don't obey the Lord, if you don't submit yourself, if you don't bring glory and honor to His name, you're going to find yourself in a storm. You're going to find yourself in trouble. And last but not least, we should be up in the mountain with Jesus, watching and praying. Amen. Praise God. Because there's people today that are out in the storm and they need our prayers. There's people out in the storm, they need someone to come to them in their storm and give them a word. Amen. Give them, give them direction. Give them strength. Help them. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, that's all I have for this message. God bless you.